The problem with genetic work is that you have to have ideally families where you've got some family members clearly affected and some family members clearly not affected. And then you can take the DNA from the entire family and work through and find out what abnorm genetic abnormalities you can find in those that are affected versus the non-affected. The problem with lipedema is having big enough families and more importantly families where you're absolutely certain who's affected not affected and that's quite difficult. Uh, I saw only the other day a daughter of an affected patient and I'd reassured that mother I thought well she doesn't look as if she's got the right phenotype which means the physical characteristics for lipedema. Um, but at 30 things are beginning to change so it's it's a difficult one so if we'd used her DNA we would probably called her unaffected and that would completely skew the results so it may prove difficult yet using families to find a gene another way would of course be to collect DNA from lots and lots of patients we were certain had uh, lipedema and DNA from patients we were certain didn't, and that might. Uh, so um, we, we, we're still at it, but as yet we haven't uh, cracked the code. The thing about lipedema, we still don't know if it's primarily a fat disorder or primarily a lymph problem. The fact that so many lipedema patients go on to develop lymphedema does suggest that the lymphatics are not normal and yet when I've investigated patients with what I call pure lipedema who have not got any element of lymphedema, it's very difficult to find an abnormality with the lymphatics. At the moment, we can't identify any difference between the fat of lipedema and the fat of morbid obesity. And the further complication is lipedema patients undoubtedly have a predisposition to morbid obesity. So it's a complex situation and I don't think the answer is gonna be that quick or that easy. After all, although, I mean, lipedema was only described in 1940 for the first time, so it's actually a very modern condition. If you go back to the original description of lipedema, which was published in 1940, and in that paper, and they called it lipedema with orthostatic edema, and what that means is there was lipedema, but there is a fluid element giving rise to edema. Orthostatic tends to mean that it, it's in a dependent or gravitationally influenced edema. And that unquestionably does occur with lipedema. You've only got to talk to patients and they'll say by the end of the day that there's an element of swelling and fluctuant swelling. Well, fat doesn't go up and down. It means that there is a fluid element to it. Um, and all fluid swelling means there is an element of lymphatic failure either because the lymphatics are solely not coping with normal demand of fluid drainage or blood vessels are actually releasing excessive fluid and therefore overwhelming the lymphatics so the lymphatics can't cope all edema has to be that scenario one one or the other scenario so it may be in lipedema that the blood vessels do release extra fluid. I'm not sure anyone's looked at that. Um, and the lymphatics, is, I, I've used the word sluggish uh, in terms of their response. But that edema will disappear usually overnight with elevation. And that's where the orthostatic bit that uh, Alan and Myers described comes in. Whereas lymphedema, uh, will improve overnight but not usually resolve. So nobody really understands that so-called orthostatic edema element of it, but it, it, it definitely exists in, well, I think 95% of the patients I've seen. It's the leg or the ankle that swells. The foot do often doesn't swell, whereas most edemas you'd expect the more dependent or gravitational influence site, like the foot, would swell as, as well. So there's, there's something about the fat tissue that allows or encourages this edema to develop. What we do know about lipedema, it manifests with excessive fat, 
in a particular distribution, we know that it doesn't come on before puberty. Uh, that doesn't mean to say hormones are abnormal, it means that the condition is hormone sensitive. And I don't believe that there are hormonal abnormalities in women who get lipedema. Um, but clearly hormones influence the development of the condition. Uh, so we, we, we know that, and I, I say that lipedema tends to present at times of hormonal change. So although probably the majority develop it at puberty, it's not unusual to see women who develop it uh, at time of pregnancy or, or even menopause, which is something that is very hard to understand because if you think it is estrogen related, estrogen triggered, then you wouldn't expect a problem at the menopause. So, so anyway, so it doesn't come on before puberty and we know it's ex excess fat. I'm pretty confident it's inherited. We've got such strong family pedigrees that although we haven't found a gene, I think it's, it's definitely inherited. Pain and tenderness are unquestionably features of lipedema and features that distinguish it, in my view, from obesity, because obesity doesn't particularly produce those symptoms. But those symptoms are very variable within lipedema. You can see classic lipedema patients who don't complain of any pain. Uh, tenderness is minimal. Uh, others where tenderness is quite a common feature, I mean a, a consistent feature, should I say. Um, and then you have a minority where spontaneous pain is a problem. And we haven't really any understanding of what generates that pain and tenderness. We know from certain fat conditions, not fat conditions, fat tumours, um, a lipoma can be exquisitely tender, particularly what's called an angiolipoma, which means there are blood vessels associated with that fat, benign fat tumour. So I think we've still got a lot to learn about what nerve endings or pain fibres within blood vessels. Uh, I don't think it's the fat per se that's generating the pain and tenderness. It's going to be probably a blood vessel element or a nerve element within the fat that's, that's responsible. But that's pure speculation. Lipedema provides a very loose framework for that excess fat. Without sounding rude, it, it creates a very loose, wobbly sort of fat. Many people would say, well, excessive fat does wobble. But in lipedema, there is a loss of structure, support structure for those fat lobules. That's why cellulite is such a 100% feature of, of, of lipedema. And I suspect it's a lack of support in the connective tissue. Again, this is hypothesis. This, there's no proof behind. This is observation and just my thoughts. But some connective tissue uh, support issue that uh, may allow um, the blood vessels, if they're a bit unsupported, to break and therefore and therefore bruise without much trauma at all. After all, knee pain is another feature of lipedema and I think so many uh, teenagers and young females go off to see orthopaedic surgeons because of knee pain and nothing's found. But I suspect that too may be something to do with a lack of support for the structures so they then get might get patellar man alignment or something. Uh, because of the loose nature of the tissues. When you come up with um, prevalence figures, in other words, how many in a population has got a certain disease, you really want a marker of that disease, and we don't have one for lipedema. It's a clinical judgment. And uh, the problem is dis distinguishing it from gynoid obesity. Uh, the difference being that if someone with gynoid obesity successfully diets, the fat will be lost. But in lipedema, it seems to be diet resistant. But a bit like there's a therefore a, probably an overlap between the two. Now, I don't know how you, and a lot of women may not have dieted successful, successfully. So how do you then 
distinguish a gynoid obesity from a lipedema. And gynoid obesity is certainly very common. Because of this propensity to morbid obesity as well, you then get a hybrid of the two, and then, then it's particularly difficult. And then the knees will cause even more problems, and it's a downhill spiral, so it becomes very difficult. So in lipedema, uh, I think it's absolutely crucial that that morbid obesity component is kept under control, uh, because I don't think liposuction is a, is a sensible treatment if morbid obesity is complicating the picture, um, because that probably will recur. But the ones that have been uh, have had very little in the way of morbid obesity, I think have done well because they've often been younger, they've often been able to remain quite active. I think exercise is, is, abs is what I put number one. Number two, uh, weight control. And certainly if someone's got lipedema but they're thin, I say to them, whatever you do, don't put uh, weight on without trying to make them anorexic, uh, which of course happens with uh, lipedema, not infrequently. I do use compression garments because I believe during exercise that is going to be a, uh, more effective, not necessarily in reducing the size of the legs, but it's certainly going to improve lymph drainage, should help control the orthostatic edema component and I would like to think would prevent progression to lymphedema. Manual lymphatic drainage is a difficult one. It's certainly effective in easing symptoms and uh, reducing edema. The problem is, uh, do you just keep going with it indefinitely? I mean, that's not financially sustainable in my view, so you have to come up with a, a compromise. I justify it only on the grounds of pain, because it actually can help pain, which then might suggest that the fluid is also having some influence on the pain element because the patients say to me it's often very relieving from a pain point of view. And there's just not sufficient awareness amongst the medical uh, community. Although I have to say I think it, that is improving and it's been the patient body that has, in, uh, has done most to create awareness. Now that's not in itself going to suddenly produce a new treatment but if you you increase awareness then there is more um, pressure to, to get on and, and do something and research bodies may be more uh, responsive to having uh, research into lipedema and you will then encourage healthcare professionals perhaps to look into various aspects after all success in research is probably proportional to the number of researchers you've got working on it. You have to believe that you can make a difference and that's, that's going to increase. The awareness issue is the first step I think and so if you raise awareness, create interest, then hopefully it will, that, that will act as a springboard to try and get uh, more going. The research side is still difficult because it's difficult to know where to start with it. We've got our genetic element which we're still hopeful will bear fruit but when I don't know but designing other studies is still quite difficult when you don't know what you're looking for really you don't uh, uh, do we look at the fat we we've looked at the lymph system and as I say it doesn't look too bad so we're going to have to be a lot more clever about trying to find out what the abnormality is <laughs>